September 23rd has come and gone, and while it may hold relevance to things happening that we don't understand, many people made false prophets out of themselves because of the predictions of the rapture. Matthew 24, 4-8 through And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. The verse we're going to single in on is verse 7. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. The way this scripture is worded in English would lead modern English speakers to think that the Messiah was just repeating himself when he said nation versus nation and kingdom versus kingdom. But the reality is that these words have a distinct meaning. The word nation used here in Greek is ethnos, which is where we get the English word ethnicity. Also, the English word nation would be understood by non-modern English speaking people to be nationality. The word for kingdom is basilia, which means kingdom, country, or leadership over a country. So what we see the Messiah prophesying is about a coming race war, or a war among the heathen. Right now in America, and other parts of the world for that matter, we see a divide between races or ethnicity that is growing at a rapid rate. Whether instigated by the mainstream media or not, the tensions are escalating. Even so-called Christians who are supposed to be citizens of another ethnos or kingdom that is not of this world are getting their words in and reacting to their flesh fillings. After the election of Donald Trump, many races have felt like they no longer have a voice in our country. They are reminded of a time when they were lesser citizens and were treated accordingly. During Obama's presidency, white Americans felt like they were losing control while they felt their money they had worked hard for their entire life was to be taken away through taxation and giving to those that were not working for it. Although neither of these things are fully true, the media has played an important role in affirming their fears. The fact is that this country was founded for and by occultists. They have continued to assert control in slavery through taxation, media, and medical witchcraft. What is better than a slave that pays for their own health care, housing, and food? They would no longer be bound to the burden of taking care of their slaves. They would take a cut of everyone's money and give their slaves the appearance of freedom. Also, they would no longer only have black and Irish slaves, but all Americans would be slaves and would pay their dues. Mr. Jones owned a cotton plantation and many slaves. One day he was talking to the owner of the plantation next to his, and Mr. Jones was lamenting the fact that times were tough, he was having to work his slaves harder than ever, and was having trouble with some of them being disobedient or trying to run away. The other plantation owner said he knew someone who could help. Day one. One day Mr. Jones called his slaves together so a man named Mr. Smith could talk to them. Before beginning, Mr. Smith whispered to Mr. Jones, Whatever I say, do not contradict me or interfere, and I promise you your slave troubles will end. My name is Mr. Smith, he said to the slaves, and this may be the happiest day of your lives. From today forward, you will no longer be slaves, but free men. Mr. Jones was so shocked, he started to step forward, but Mr. Smith gestured for him to remain silent. He did, only because the other plantation owner had spoken so highly of Mr. Smith's skills. You are no longer the property of Mr. Jones, Mr. Smith continued. You are free. No more will you be forced to labor for the benefit of Mr. Jones. Now you can work for yourselves. Now the slaves were all murmuring and looking at each other. Many were smiling, many were looking puzzled. In fact, you are now free to leave the plantation whenever you want, Mr. Smith said. However, since we are surrounded by other plantations, if you leave, some other plantation owner will likely claim you as his own the moment you set foot on his property. So I urge you not to risk your newfound freedom by doing something so foolish. Instead, I suggest that you stay here, no longer as slaves, but as willing participants and part owners of this plantation. Yes, this is now your plantation. Mr. Jones bit his tongue to keep from objecting. For now, we might as well leave Mr. Jones in charge, said Mr. Smith, since he's the only one with any experience at running a plantation, which is quite a complicated thing to manage. But he will no longer be your master, but just another worker on the plantation. In fact, he will now be using his organizational and management skills to serve you. Whatever problems you may have had with him before, you are now all equals. And you need each other to make this work. If we all cooperate and work together, we can all reap the benefits together. In honor of this happy occasion, I present you this new symbol of togetherness and cooperation, this flag, which shall be the emblem of the new free Jones Plantation. He held up the new flag, but most of those listening were still too amazed to respond. And this shall be our motto, Mr. Smith announced. 
We work together as free men for our mutual benefit, pledging our allegiance to the Jones Plantation, which stands for prosperity, liberty, and justice for all. To celebrate, everyone has the rest of the day off. Enjoy your freedom, do as you please, and be back here tomorrow morning, bright and early, so that we may begin work on this great and noble new endeavor as equal free men. Finally convinced that Mr. Smith was serious, the former slaves applauded and cheered. Day two. We all want this plantation to do well, Mr. Smith said at the beginning of the next meeting, so we can all share in the benefits. We all know that it takes a lot of effort to make a cotton plantation work. Just because you're all free doesn't mean you can stop working. In fact, since you're now working for yourselves, I expect you to work even harder than ever before, but now with pride and joy, knowing that you're working for yourselves. Of course, there still have to be rules. If everyone just does whatever he wants, the plantation won't produce anything. This experiment will fail and we'll all starve. You should be thankful that Mr. Jones has agreed to stay on to lend his knowledge and skills to this endeavor, and I trust you will all do your own part to make this work. Several of you have been chosen to act as project supervisors, to manage different aspects of the operation, to make sure everyone is doing his assigned job, to make sure that the rules are followed, and so on. The rest of you may head out to the fields to start your first day of work as free men. Day three. The next morning, Mr. Smith had a grim expression on his face as the daily meeting began. I have an unpleasant duty to do today, he said. Yesterday, Charles was caught keeping some of the cotton he picked, presumably to sell for his own personal profit. That is against the rules. That is stealing. For that, Charles must be punished. Two men tied Charles to the whipping post. I take no joy in this, Mr. Smith continued, but you must understand, if we do not maintain order, if we do not have rules that we all abide by, then the plantation will fail, and we will all suffer. The whip cracked against Charles' back. But if we all pitch in for the common good, then we can all prosper. Being free doesn't mean you should be selfish and greedy. We must each do our assigned duties and obey the rules, and then we can all benefit, and each of you will receive your appropriate share of the profits. A young man named Samuel stepped forward. But if you and Mr. Jones decide the rules and whip us if we disobey, how is that any different from what we had before? How can you say that, Mr. Smith asked. I'm shocked. You were a slave before, and now you're free. Things still need to be managed and organized by those best qualified to do so. Do you know how to run a plantation, Samuel? Well, no, he answered. But if we're free, why do we get no say in what the rules are and how things work? I'm surprised at your ingratitude, Mr. Smith answered. None of you know how a plantation is run, so you're in no position to be making decisions about how things are done here. You don't seem to appreciate all the things that Mr. Jones provides for you, from protecting you from all the outside threats that you know nothing about, those who would come here, capture and enslave you, if not for Mr. Jones' protection, to making sure that you all have food and housing, tools to work with, you're cared for when sick and injured, and so on. There wouldn't be a plantation at all, no cotton to pick, no land to plant and harvest, if not for him. You should be grateful that he's made possible the level of comfort you now have. Your lives would be far worse, if not for him. Nevertheless, as free and equal participants in this endeavor, from now on, at each meeting, any worker may have two minutes to ask questions or voice suggestions or complaints. With that, the workers all seemed satisfied and headed out again to the fields to pick the cotton. Day four. I have a big announcement, Mr. Smith said as the daily meeting began. Mr. Jones' cousin is here, and not just to visit and see how our project is coming along. It has been decided that from now on, you will be deciding who will manage the plantation. Of course, this job can't be done by just anyone, but every three months we will have a special meeting at which all the workers will vote on whether we think Mr. Jones should run the plantation or whether we think his cousin, Mr. Johnson, should run the plantation. That means that ultimately you are in charge because you will be deciding which man you want running things on your behalf. If you don't like the way things are being managed, you now have the power to change it. Amazed and pleased, the workers headed out again to the fields to pick the cotton. Days passed, months passed, a year passed, and the plantation continued to operate as before. Sometimes Mr. Jones was in charge, sometimes Mr. Johnson was in charge, but the day-to-day -day routine stayed exactly the same. The workers worked hard, long hours every day, and still had little to show for it. Every day the meeting would begin with them all reciting the Jones Plantation motto, We work together as free men for our mutual benefit, pledging our allegiance to the Jones Plantation, which stands for prosperity, liberty, and justice for all. One day Mr. Smith announced, Samuel has asked to say a few words this morning, and whatever the rest of us may think of his ideas and opinions, we are all free here, and that means we are all allowed to speak our minds. So, Samuel, you have two minutes. Begin. Samuel stepped forward, looking scared. I was excited when all this started, he began, glancing nervously at Mr. Smith and Mr. Jones. But don't you all see what's happened here? Nothing's changed. We're all still slaves. There were grumbles of disagreement from the crowd. They tell us what to do and whip us if we don't. They still make all the rules and punish us if we disobey. They let us make suggestions and complain about things, but they never really change anything. They let us choose between Mr. Jones and Mr. Johnson, but what's the difference? The situation stays the same. We do all of the work and they take as much as they want and decide how much they'll let us keep. They live in luxury, made rich by the cotton we pick. We do all the work and have to build our own huts, grow our own food, and take care of ourselves. They leave us just enough that we don't revolt or run away. This is not freedom. We're all still slaves. They've only changed the words they use, but nothing else has changed. They say we're all free and equal, but we're not. They command and we obey. That's not freedom. That's not equality. They say we're free to leave, but all that means is that we're free to be someone else's slave. Why should we work or obey the rules? We didn't agree to this. They made the system. They forced it on us. They control and rob us and call it freedom. They've deceived you into thinking that being able to choose which slave master you'll work for is the same as being free. It's not. Open your eyes. If you keep what you produce, they call it stealing. When they take what you produce, they call it sharing and fair distribution. Can't you see that this is all... Your time is up, Samuel, Mr. Smith announced calmly. At his gesture, two supervisors grabbed Samuel by the arms and led him to the whipping post. I'm sorry, Samuel, but you've broken the rules. There are rules against encouraging others not to work and encouraging others to break the rules. You're only hurting all of us with your discontentment and your complaining and your disobedience. The whip fell and Samuel let out a grunt. Without rules, without order, all would be lost. Without law, there would be chaos. 
We can't just behave as wild animals, each doing whatever he pleases. We must all follow the plan and all do our duty for the betterment of everyone. And those who do not must be punished. The whip fell again and blood flowed freely from Samuel's back. Samuel, it is you who are stealing from the others. When you don't do your assigned work, you are making more work for others. When you disobey the rules, it is you who are endangering the future of everyone else here. You are the thief. You are the criminal. You are the one trying to destroy the arrangement that keeps us all safe and prosperous. At every lash of the whip, the other workers cheered louder and louder, some yelling curses at Samuel. Being spoiled and selfish, you complain about everything, talking as if you're oppressed. But you are the one ruining things. You are the one keeping us from being all we could be. It is your greed and your rebelliousness that is hurting all of us. They all play by the rules, Mr. Smith said, gesturing at the others. What makes you think that you don't have to? You think you're above the law? There were loud yells of agreement as the whip fell again. We must maintain order, Mr. Smith proclaimed, to make this plantation great, to make it so that we can all be happy and prosperous. To have the society we want, there have to be rules. We all have to contribute our fair share to this great endeavor, and we cannot tolerate actions and attitudes that seek to undermine the amazing things that together as free men we have achieved and will continue to achieve. Mr. Jones was smiling as he gave Mr. Smith a pat on the back. The crowd was cheering so loudly that none of them had noticed that Samuel had died. These presidents and leaders of the kingdoms, owned by Satan, are friends behind closed doors and laugh at the reaction they get from the peasants through the staged events they perpetrate. Sure, there were times when morals prevailed because the church was in obedience to the Most High, but through a series of stumbling blocks placed before them, they fell prey to wickedness, which quickly gave control back to the satanic elite. The whole purpose and desire of what we do is to wake people up from the matrix so that they will see things for what they really are. The children of Israel, white, black, and brown, had fallen for an enchantment perpetrated by a false narrative called media and entertainment. They have given themselves over to fornication and abominations, which has allowed a curse to overtake them. Please see these things for what they are, no matter how hurt you may feel about your race or respect for your country. The enchantment can't last if we see it for what it is. There are hundreds of channels. Can they all be doing this? What matters, though, is not the channels. It's who owns those channels. Uh, and that issue of media consolidation is critical. The rise in the use of video news releases has a great deal to do with conglomeration of the mass media. Because as more and more TV stations around the country come to be owned by the you know, fewer and fewer players, there's more and more cost cutting that goes on in the newsrooms of these stations. You know, when you look at a media environment where only five or six companies control the vast majority of the world's media and they work in collaboration with each other and they share members of boards of directors and things of that nature. Like, in the same way that I say we have to broaden our concept of subliminal, I think we also have to broaden our concept of what a conspiracy is. They're using our airwaves and they have a responsibility to bring out the full diversity of opinion and to get to the truth, not to bring you uh, news stories that are disguised as their own when they're simply government or corporate propaganda. It's been Washington's biggest mystery since Watergate. What kind of dog will the Obamas choose? Our resident veterinarian, Dr. We have to pass the bill so that you can uh, find out what is in it. And look, li this is one time. Forget the conspiracy. Listen to our government agencies. These guys are telling the truth. You know, there's no conspiracy here, folks. Just get your damn vaccine. All right. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Mercury-containing vaccines may help not harm kids, according to two new studies in the journal Pediatrics. There have been widespread concerns that mercury-based preservatives and vaccines might impair the neurological development of children. These new studies suggest that the opposite, that the preservatives may actually be associated with improved behavior and mental performance. I think people should be careful when they wish for on China. You know, if China were to revalue its currency, or China is to start making, say, toys that don't have lead in them, or food that isn't poisonous, their costs of production are going to go up. And that means prices at Walmart here in the United States are going to go up, too. So I would say China is our greatest friend right now. They're keeping prices low, and they're keeping prices... Today, six corporations control all major media in the United States, including the principal television networks. These six corporate entities, in turn, control the information being broadcast on a daily basis. The average American adult watches more than four hours of television each day. The constant flow of entertainment, news, and information that is consumed by the American public shapes their perception of the reality in which they live. By controlling the dissemination of information, broadcasters and their corporate heads are able to control the masses. The constant, carefully shaped messages on television guide the public to predetermined conclusions. Therefore, TV has become a weapon of mass persuasion. United we stand, divided we fall. 
Either you're in the kingdom of Israel through Jesus, or you are part of the prophecy of the heathen ethnical divisions who will be fighting each other. Thank you for listening. Subscribe, share, like, and please share your thoughts.